So, you got a boyfriend? <laughs> Why? You want to ask me out on a date? Maybe. Do you have a boyfriend? Mm. No. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. What did you say? I want to know who I'm talking to. That's not what you said. What do you think I said? What? Hello? Look, I gotta go. Wait, I thought we were gonna go out. Uh, nah, I don't think so. Don't hang up on me. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is Kieran, the host of Citizen Frame. It is a new year, and and, uh, what better way to bring in the new year than with horror? Go figure. The gang at Citizen Frame is doing a horror film. (laughs) Just for a change. (laughs) Yeah, we didn't see that one coming. First and foremost, um, that is uh, one of the regular misfits joining me today. That's Trevor. What's up, bud? How was the new year? All good. Um, great to be here as always, Kieran. Yeah, it's um, had a quiet Christmas, but the way I like it these days, you know. Uh, but it's good to be back doing these podcasts as always. Yeah. We're thinking what films we want to start off with with the new year. The Scream franchise. Yeah, I was actually surprised that we haven't done the Scream films yet. But this is the perfect time to do it with the new one coming out. Uh, well, we kind of did that for Halloween. The Halloweens came out right at a time when we got Halloween kills. Yeah. So... It kind of it fell into place. Yeah. Um, the Scream franchise started in 1996. It's kind of a fun one because we've talked um, uh, our boy once, Wes Craven, who we sadly passed away about five, six years ago or something with a unfortunate uh, brain tumor. And we lost a horror icon on that yep. day for sure. And Wes Craven's always had kind of bad luck with cinema. And the reason I say that in the 70s, you have all these directors who kind of have what they call flash of genius. Now, I will talk about The Last House on the Left, and I think it's a vile film. I'm not a fan of it, so it, we can it, skip it. it. It's, it's a tough watch, um, and that comes from someone, I mean, nothing you know, fictional or nothing really offends me, but Last House on the Left, yeah, it's, it's heavy It's heavy going. So it yeah. is, it's, it's not exactly family viewing, let's just say. <laughs> Exactly, it's not. Um, it is a tough watch, um, but it does have its call following. I actually thought the remake was actually pretty good. That I haven't seen the remake yet. Back. Yeah, his son produced it, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But the kind of... Uh, it was him and Sean Cunningham who did The Last House on the Left. Sean Cunningham did Friday 13th. That put him on the map for That's sure. Right. And Wes did a little film called The Hills Have Eyes. Yeah. Um, pretty dark cannibalistic uh, film. Uh, pretty edgy for its time. It was definitely his Texas Chainsaw. Is yeah. the way I look at this one, and it's the one that solidified him. That gave him entry into the uh, um. Well, I wouldn't say a listers yet, but get the horror hall of fame. Pro- yeah, or get to uh, it allowed him to be able to choose his next project. Now we did yeah. a couple of series, a series of different projects that just tanked. He was not happy that he was actually pretty much forced to do the Hill of Ice Two, um, which was uh, considered horrible. I actually saw it a long time ago. I kind of remember liking it, actually, to be fair to you. Yeah, uh, but I haven't visited in a while. Then he did Deadly Blessing, which was but an Amish murder or something. It was bad. Um, then he did Deadly Friend with Kirstie Swanson about a killer robot girl. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm really not giving Wes any any credit here. He also but, did a TV, a made for TV movie called Invitation to Hell, and I remember watching it as a kid, and it really freaking me out. It's about this yeah. sort of like um, fitness club, um, you know, this like really rich in sort of Beverly Hills or California or some fitness club, but they're yeah. actually some sort of cult, or um, and there's a portal to hell in it. It's really oh, weird and really sort of disorientating, and I remember it freaking me out as a kid. Um, I'll like almost John, revisit it. Isn't like John Travolta in that or something? There's, um, some point, a, there's an A-lister in it. Yeah, it's it's not. I don't think it's John Travolta, but it's it's. Um, I'll have to look it up. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm well, a, look I remember up. being a really strange one. Um, 
Yeah, he said he he did a couple different stuff that didn't really pan out, but of course we all know about the 1984 little gem of a film called Nightmare on Elm Street. Classic. And from there, even they weren't box office hit. He, he to this day, besides the point being is Nightmare on Elm Street was a hit, but then he want, walked away from it, and rightfully so. He don't he didn't want to be one of these franchisees, which yeah, <laughs> ironically enough. Scream's about to show, show up. But he did a series of films that I fucking love. He went like Carpenter style. What happened to Carpenter was he wasn't big box office draw either. He had a couple, you know, a couple, you know, hits. Obviously, yeah. Halloween being his golden boy. But he became more of a cult director, and so did Wes Craven. Mm-hmm. Because the next few movies I'm about to mention, I think, are, are just, just such good horror. And that's The Serpent in the Rainbow, um, which is such a yeah. terrifying film about voodoo. Mm-hmm. Um, and a little little hidden gem, which I always like to see. And I know you're going to love it because you love your fucking Twin Peaks. So, Trevor, let's get this out of the way. The People Under the Stairs. Yeah. Uh, and also, we also did one called Shocker. Um, yes. Which yep. starred Mitch Pelegi, who played um, Skinner, um, you know, um, who, who was basically Mulder and Scully's boss in the X-Files. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Shocker was a fun one. It was a great soundtrack, too. Yeah, uh, but yeah, but they weren't they weren't hits, but they were critical hits. Critical, so yeah. that kind of kind of kept them in the with loop. the fans. Yeah, Vampire in Brooklyn was crap. He did with mm-hmm. Eddie Murphy. Yes, um, but I always respected him, like like Carpenter, not listening, going to the mainstream. He always did his own stuff. Yeah, he could have stuck with Nightmare on Elm Street and did sequel after sequel. Um, he could have. You know, but he didn't. He wanted to do something different. Every film he's done is something completely different. And of course, the, the sort of blueprint for Scream was the eventual sort of Nightmare on Elm Street sequels that he did, the Freddy's Dead ones. Um, you know, are you know, sorry, Final Nightmare is, is that what you called it? Oh, you're thinking of um, Wes's New Nightmare? Where New Nightmare? Was real? Sorry, yes, sorry, yeah. New Nightmare. Yeah, um, where it was actually, very meta. Actually, another underrated little film. I kind of like that one. Yeah. Um, so, Kevin Williamson, a young uh, screenwriter at the time, um, massive kudos to Kevin Williamson. He kind of brought back the slasher a bit um, because in the early 90s, mid 90s, you're getting a lot of right straight to video slashers, even if you were even getting them in at all. Um, so, Kevin Williamson reinvented it a little bit by writing Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, Killing Mrs. Tingle, these kind of uh, the, fal- the faculty. And yeah. Faculty is so, a good film. Yeah, so he brought he brought a different take. He brought like a Dawson's Creek feel to it, which yes. ironically enough, he did Dawson's Creek. Yeah. And like a Party on Five feel. Yeah. Uh, but R-rated. Very and, 90s. Yes. And the cool thing about, it was originally going to go to Oliver Stone. And Oliver Stone ter- got turned away from it because uh, Kevin Williamson uh, had didn't have faith in Stone telling it as violent as Kevin Williams, he wanted it. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, know that about Oliver Stone was um, yep. at the, at, right. And I, he's I actually don't, and don't think and he would have been suited to this type of film. I know. Well, I actually Oliver Stone used to be our screenwriter. He wrote a horror movie called The Hand with Michael he Caine. Al- he also wrote the um, nineteen eighty three remake of Scarface with Al Pacino. Yeah, so he's he's he, uh, but uh, that'd be something different. But that's why Oliver Stone has a cameo in the film. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but. Obviously, the Weinstein brother. Obviously, we'll just mention Bob Weinstein. We won't talk about Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> but we got it. We got to credit the Weinstein, the Merrimax, for for giving us Dimension. And Dimension obviously spawned a series of films, uh, horror films that is. And obviously, Scream was their Nightmare on Elm Street, which kind of built Dimension. Yeah. And um, here we are. We're Scream. Man. Yeah. That was a long intro. Yeah, but it's yeah, it was all relevant. Exactly. Well, that's the first time ever I said anything that's relevant. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so let's just jump right into it. The first thing I have to applaud the film for, and we'll go off by saying it now: when you kill off your main lead, yeah, he does a Hitchcock, yeah, in his own his own unique way, and it's brilliant. You know, yeah, he did his psycho by killing off the lead. She was the draw. She was the I guess you can say a lister at the time. The face um, on the poster. The face on the poster. And when you kill her off right away, Mary, movies have copied this since they did it with Steven Seagal and Executive Decision. It came out about a year later. She should maybe kill Steven Seagal off in real life, but that, yeah, no, yeah, that was actually <laughs> that's a good another thing, story. Yeah, it starred Kurt Russell, so I'd rather see more Kurt Russell. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, but watching this film, I always say it's through the podcast eyes. And you always kiss little things. And this opening sequence is one of the best opening sequences in horror history. Yeah, I agree. It's a brilliant um, sequence. Not to not to not to mention the how mo- how many films have copied this. I do want to mention a little film that came out in 1977, 78, and it's called When a Stranger Calls. Yes, it is a hidden gem. If you guys want, we might get to it. But if you guys want to see a cool little thriller, yeah. see it. But it's about the urban legend. the The first half of the film focuses on us babysitter getting a phone call. Have yeah. you checked the children? Have you checked the children? Well, this is where he clearly got this idea from. Yeah, and uh, I mean the, the the whole the whole film of Scream is, is a hum- homage to you know all of these you know classic sort of slicer films and stuff. But yeah, yeah. So it's in there as well. You know, th- there, there's everything going on. But but the great thing about it is it's homage done right, and also putting its own unique spin on it with brilliant characters as well. It's brilliantly written and brilliantly directed. Yes, so it, is. it is. It is. Uh... I'll give you an example of how good this is. We talked um, Halloween. We talked uh, Evil Dead. And the, the two things those have movies have in common, and a lot of good horror films, they always have that sequence where, okay, something something's about to turn here. We talked about the long driveway shot and the silence yeah. in Evil Dead. It was funny and fun and charming, and then, boom, you knew something changed. Halloween, yes. they reveal the, the killer's the kid in the beginning of the sequence, and the camera pans up, and you got the eerie music. Boom, yeah. you know something's about to happen. This does the same thing, but the great thing about it, 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 it tugs. It, it, obviously, it winks at you with all the movie cliche, all the movie trivia, yeah. and and what's great about it. There's a great shot. There's a great scene where she's getting the phone call. I, we won't go over the whole thing because you all know the film by the back of your hand. But you know, having poking fun. What's your favorite? What's your favorite scary movie? And yada yada yada. But as you're having this good good banter, all he says was. Um, you never told me your name. And she goes, why? You want to ask me on a date? No, I just want to know who I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. And then the music changes. The just tone like, changes. Yeah. Yep. And right there, she goes, what did you just say? Um, yeah. I want to know who I'm talking to. No, you didn't say that. And right from that <laughs> line, it escalates. It's no longer the fun little tongue-in-cheek banter that these two are having. It's actually the scariest um, scene in the entire film, you know, you know, in terms of terror, you know, actual proper you know, sort of horror and terror. Um, yeah. The rest of it's great, but it's more sort of meta, tongue-in-cheek, you know, sort of um, homage, but homage done greatly. But um, f- for sheer sort of terror and horror, that's, it's a fantastic, it's just a brilliant scene. It's flawless. Yeah, it's, it, it's so good. Um, there's a scene where it, what I liked about it too was when she fights back, mm-hmm. you can hear the killer groaning. Yeah. So right there, the audience already knows. Okay, this guy's—you can take this guy down. He's not Michael Myers. Yeah, he's human. He's human. So there's so you know, and and it, you know he so he can you can't, 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 can't take a hit. You can't do this. So he falls down when he's taking when he gets hit and stuff like that. So I liked that. I liked showing that the that the killer is vulnerable. There's a brilliant uh, touch as well. Just at, at the very end of this um, scene, just as uh, she's dying, where she removes the killer's mask, yeah. but the camera just cuts away at the last second. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you don't really see her reaction. I was seeing if you can see a reaction as she's being stabbed, but she doesn't really give much of a reaction to it. There is yeah. a... Um, and then, <laughs> So when she's killed and the parents show up, there's a great line when he goes, I need you to drive down to the McKenzie's and call the police. Because yeah. the parents realize their phone's line. That's the line from Halloween. Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, that, that, he, Jim, Jimmy D. Curtis says that, or, or someone. Yeah. Say, yeah, she tell she tells she tells the kids mm-hmm. run down to the McKenzie's house. Yes, call the police. Uh, nice little um, a nice little wink. Um, then we're introduced to Billy, and we got Billy, and he's coming in the house, and you know he's. Uh, and did you notice? This is kind of fun, and I don't know if this was deliberate. It could be just me. But when Billy, we're introduced to Billy uh, and Sydney, and he's in her room, bedroom. Yeah. Did you hear the music in the background? I'm I'm not too sure. Um, it's, uh, don't it's don't don't fear the reaper. Don't fear the reaper. Yes. Uh, it's, it's kind of giving you a hint. Yeah, and it's also um, very similar to the scene where in Nightmare on Elm Street, where Glenn, played by Johnny Depp, goes through, um, you know, climbs through Nancy's window and um, bedroom yeah. window as well. So yeah. it is. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, 
there's all these homages in it, and some of them are more obvious, where some are sort of are less obvious. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see the uh, the, the the Freddy Krueger sweater in the closet, yes. but it's yes. more of a female style. Yeah. Um, but my point, I guess, the, the conversation that these two had about you know our relationship is more of a PG thirteen rating. Yeah. You know, um, it's very fun. Yes. Um, and you go with it. And the great thing about the it's film, brilliant dialogue. You know, it is. It knows how to have fun, but yeah. at the same time, it knows how to turn it. Yes. Um, I'll give you an example. A perfect example is <laughs> he should be having a good laugh, but he's quite good in it, is uh, our boy Henry Winkler, the Fonz. Yes. <laughs> and he plays the, the, the principal. And there's the great scene where he, the janitor looks like Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Played um, by Wes Craven. Yep. Played by Wes himself. And and how, how he's always looking in the mirror. Yeah, like the fawns. Like the fawns. Um, but, it, but it's done in a way where you don't really catch it right away. Yeah. It's not like throwing it. Like, it's not like airplane, like a farce. Yeah. It, you know, it, it's all done naturally. So it is, and, and it all weaves perfectly within the story of, of yeah. Scream and stuff, you know, and within with the characters. You know, we, you talked about the the writing and the characters. You know what's really good for this? We How many times we talk about like Slumber Party Massacre where the cast is like 50? Yeah. And the great thing about this, they all look their ages. Yes. Yeah, they look like teenagers. Yeah, I couldn't, you couldn't really go, oh, Jesus, how old is that guy? <laughs> um, so it, the casting is was spot on. Uh-huh. Um, and it, it just, it worked it, and it gelled well. Um, but the funny thing is, the great yeah. thing about slasher films is is that with slasher films, even if the acting's hammy, we kind of talked about that a little bit in Halloween. Um, not to disrespect Halloween, you know, it's my favorite horror film. But the acting could have been hammy, but you still like the characters. Absolutely. And you, you didn't want to see them get it. Absolutely. I mean, um, one of my all-time favorite horror film characters is the completely over-the-top, ridiculous um, Captain Rhodes in Day of the Dead. And, you know, this is pure B-movie sort of, you know, acting and sort of over-the-top. And, you know, but you still love the character, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's a nice shot. I don't know if you caught it. And I know most of you people, we're not going to go through the whole film because I think everyone have seen Scream. Yeah, but there's a nice shot. I don't know if anyone's caught it, or any of our listeners, or if you caught it. And again, I don't know if it's deliberate, like the "Don't Fear the Reaper" in the background. But Sydney is waiting for Tatum to pick her up, and she yes. falls asleep on the couch. And as she gets up, we see this black cloak behind her, and it's for it's just for for a couple seconds. And I tweaked out, I was like, "Oh my god, I forgot about the scene," but it's not. It's, she gets up even further. It's actually the window. Yeah, it's like a like a false scar type thing. Yes. Yeah. But it's done so clever. I just noticed it. I don't know if that again was deliberate, but it must have. I almost yeah. oh yeah. You almost thought the killer is behind the couch. Beautiful shot. Yeah. Um, oh no, Craven. Craven at this point, I, 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 for me anyway, you know, this is Craven at a, at his peak. So it is, you know, with Scream, and um, yeah, I, I mean, he knows exactly what he's doing. You know, all the little, um, you know. False, you know, um, scars and all that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. You, and yeah. what I liked about the film as well, we talked about the, the casting and the characters. Sydney's a good character because what I like about her, she's not a crybaby. She's like, you know, so, so, she, so, so when you get, I can't speak there. <laughs> That's awful. Yep. <laughs> when she gets the first phone call from from the killer, she challenges him. Mm-hmm. She calls his bluff. No, you're not. You're not in my house. Huh. Um. And I like I like that. Again, well, have the good tongue in cheek moment. She's like, "Oh, go to hell, you're an idiot." But once he calls out her mother, yeah, and he implies that he killed her, yeah. Then guess what? The tone changes again. Yeah. And what I love about that um, first phone call, you know, um, where he's where they're discussing you know horror film, you know, sort of cliches and stuff. She's saying, "Oh, it's it's insulting," you know. It's um, you know, you get these sort of you know um, dumb girls who run up the stairs whenever they should be running out of the house. Whenever the first time she is attacked, she actually does exactly that and runs back up the stairs. It's so clever in its, you know, direction and sort of, you know, obviously the writing and all as well. It, it, it sort of, it, it 
breaks the rules, or sorry, you know what I mean, it plays around with the rules, uh, but also sort of breaks them as well. It knows the rules, it, it openly talks about the rules, but it also breaks the rules and sort of, you know, plays up the rules as well. It yeah, just, I think... Yeah, it's a good call out. I think what he was trying to do there was, yeah, you can sit there and make fun of slasher films that they're going to run up the dark alley but not go in the crowded yeah. street. But if you're yes. put in that situation, you might make the same mistake. And she does that. She, and she does runs that. up the stairs instead of um, running out the front. Yeah, that's clever. I didn't catch that. That's shout yeah. out. I didn't catch that. Um, I do like how oh, everybody. The great thing about the film, it's always like everyone's a suspect blatantly. Everybody, the yeah. Movie, the movie zooms in on you. Billy uh, shows up as he's being chased by the killer. His phone drops out of his pocket. Yeah. <laughs> oh like, yeah. Absolutely. And it's dun, yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. Uh, even Fonzie is is, is quickly. Uh, almost, yeah. Uh, uh, he he's quite sinister before he gets bumped off. You know, um, just before he gets bumped off, he's like you know you think it could be him because he's sort of being quite threatening to the you know the students who have been um, you know doing the practical jokes on Sydney and stuff. You know, I I watched that scene. I was gonna I was gonna bring that up. I yeah, he, he's overreaction, but I don't know. I I kind of glad. I was like, those, I, some of those fucking punks deserved it. Yeah. Oh yeah. Definitely. But of course, we haven't mentioned one of my all time film characters ever, <laughs> um, who is basically me, um, Randy. <laughs> you know? Oh, yes, Randy. I yeah, I love the blockbuster love scene. I love yeah. the blockbusters. Everybody's a suspect. Yeah. That's uh, right. Which he's right. Everybody is a suspect. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great thing about it as well. It, it's basically um, a, really, a really good whodunit as well, you know? It is. It is clever. It is, and and kind of. There's a lot of misdirections. Yeah. Um, but those misdirections come full from full, full circle. So it's they're not cheats, if you yes. can say it. If if that's the, if that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, and but you know, rewatching it, you know, it's pretty obvious it's Billy and Stu, more so Billy, but um, you know, it plays around with that as well. So it does. It makes you think at first, yeah, it's definitely them, but then. You doubt that it's him, you know, or well, maybe it's such and such, you know, or all this, you know, maybe it is Randy or, you know, whoever else. Well, yeah, because yeah. we were with Sydney for that whole journey. So when she, she still questions him, like, uh, who was your phone call to when you were in prison, when you were in jail? Yes. Um, stuff like that. And he, it was my father. Oh, yeah. what was he? You know, she, even she has her doubts. Um, yes. Uh, so. Again, it's not one of those things where she's. It kind of comes back in the second one with her boyfriend in the second one, where, yeah. you know, she's not afraid to tell it like it is. Yeah. Like, listen, dude, you had a phone on you. You show up right at the crime scene. Um. So, <laughs> it's cool. They they're smart. Yeah. Um. And I think what she's gone through with her mother and. It was a great scene where we, we meet Gail, uh, Gail Weathers. I love that name, Gail Weathers. Yeah. <laughs> like Gail I would say as well, um, I, I wouldn't you know really be a fan of Courtney Cox, especially um, not really in Friends or anything. I always find her, her character quite irritating, but she is brilliant in this role, and she's sort of it's almost like the role she was made for. Yeah, as, bec- well, probably because of the reason you don't like her in Friends, she comes off she's shallow. Yeah, uh, she's out for her own good. She's all about promoting her book. Um, she feels that Sydney wrongfully accused um, Cotton Weary. And there's a great scene where Gail confronts her, and 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 Sydney lets her lets her guard down for a second. Gail catches it and tells her, "Wait a minute, you don't think he did it?" Yeah. Um, it's a great scene. She she's sort of ruthless. She doesn't miss a trick type thing. It's yeah. almost like she's like the sort of evil um, tongue in cheek version of Monica from Friends. Yeah, and yeah, it, it's um, she plays the role really well. Um, to be fair, there's um a couple scenes. Uh, there's one scene in particular I, I thought should have been cut, and it's the bathroom scene. I thought that was stupid. Which one was that? The one that the, she's in the bathroom and she's in the stall and the girls are kind of bad oh, yes. her mother. Yes, there's like and then the guy's leaders. in the bathroom stall and he chases her for like a second. I thought that was stupid. Well, yes, um, I think that I remember um, looking that up and um, you know just uh, for, as part of my homework for this podcast now. 
But that actually is um, the reason for that scene is because that is why um, the, um, Henry Winkler, the, the principal, expels the two, the two students. Because, you know... Oh, oh so that was one of the students? Uh, I, it may have been. Apparently, there was a deleted scene that has um, Neve Campbell, Sydney, um, running to Henry Winkler and, and say about this, you know, after the bathroom Oh, see, that should, have been, that should have been kept in then. Because that yeah. doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you? That explains why he would expel them then. Yes, yeah. For being in the girls' uh, right there, they would be expelled. So that, yeah, yeah, there, yeah, there, something wasn't right there. I was like, wait a minute, why would the yes. killer risk his own identity in a packed school? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So apparently that was connected to that, but there, there is a deleted scene where Sydney, um, after this happens, Sydney run, runs into the principal, and. Um, you know, tells him, you know, she's all, you know, upset and stuff and tells him, you know, what's just happened. Okay. Yeah, see, that makes more sense. Uh, so when Fonzie gets it, we talked about how she took, uh, how Casey in the beginning took the mask off and she can see the killer. Yeah. This one's kind of reverse. So when Fonzie gets it, he can he can see the killer in Fonzie's eye. I thought that was a cool shot. Yeah, brilliant shot. Yeah. Uh, Do you know that, that was added the last minute, that shot? Fonzie right, was, was he wasn't supposed to die. Right, yeah, um, but the and rightfully so. The Weinstein said, uh, "There hasn't been a kill in thirty minutes." Yeah, so kill the Fonz. <laughs> yeah, and it also uh, gave them then an excuse for the rest of the kids to sort of run off to see his dead body and leave the party at the end. You know, in the final oh, act. Yep, yep, that's right. Uh, let's get to the party with the, the kind of the climax of the film. So you've got uh, Tatum. Um, who I thought her death was stupid. It should have, they should have just done something simpler. Yeah, um, that it, whole it, garage it, thing was logically really it silly. doesn't really make sense, but it is a fun scene because Rose McGowan is pretty excellent. Um, you know throughout this, yeah, she's good as the badass, holds her own kind of chick. Yeah, the, um, the annoying sort of best friend type character. Yeah, and I like her throwing the bottles. Like I said, the, the killer's vulnerable. He's throwing, she's throwing full bottles of beer at him. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, that whole death was pretty stupid. They, they could have done something completely different. Like, you just, yeah. I don't know, something with one of the bottles. Make it simpler <laughs> because I thought that he, she can't get out because of her tits. And yeah. I just, I, 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 I don't know, I just don't think it fit with how clever the film has been so far. Yeah, I know, I know, I know what you're saying. I thought it was a cool scene, but it, it did sort of, um, it it did sort of push the sort of you know the the into the, the realms of real um you know being a little bit unrealistic you know it what be- I mean yes well it became almost like scary movie even makes fun of it yeah um so it almost wasn't like a like a like a parody of itself and I didn't I thought that just mm-hmm. it's smarter than that didn't need it yeah. um but I do like the the. the <laughs> Uh, yeah, the cameraman. There's yes. a great scene where when he tells Gail to go into the house of the party and put this little camera above the VCR. Yeah. And With the delay? Yes. They only mention it real quick. This is, you know, there's a 30 second delay and they let it go. Yes, because so, the first time I watched Scream, I was like, I, it confused me. I must have missed that line with the, about the, the 30 second delay. I was like, what the fuck's going on here? This is just, you know, we've already seen this part. And either replaying it, it was just, um, yeah, it threw me whenever I first watched it. Like, um, it was, it's cool because when she runs out and she goes, uh, the killer's coming and no, no, he's, he's on, he's, uh, he's on camera. He's right there. And then he goes, oh, wait a minute. It's on a 30 second. And as he turns around, he gets his throat cut. That's right. Uh, Yeah. It's a nice little subtle way of they throw something in, they plant the seed and you kind of forget about it. Yeah. And then when it's when it's brought back up, you kind of forget that it's yeah. there. It's a cool little shot. I really enjoyed that one. Um, and I, I absolutely love the scene where Randy is watching Halloween. They've, they've all left to go and see the principal's dead body. And they've all sort of um, drove off. And Randy is watching Halloween on his own. And he's going, uh, behind you, Jamie. Behind you. And, of course, the character's played by Jamie Kennedy. So he's basically talking to himself. And Ghostface is behind him. You know, with, yeah. with the... Yeah. It's a very cool scene, like. So. Um, there's a nice scene with the chase sequence, and and I it goes back to the old. Uh, so Sydney's running and she gets into the jeep. 
and she's um she locks all the doors and the killer's outside the door knocks on the window and he says i got the keys yeah. So he starts hitting the automatic keys thing and unlocking each door, and she's trying to, you know, you know, lock each door. He's unlocking the door, and then he yeah. ducks. So you don't know what side of the car he's on. And then as she's looking around, the back door, the, the trunk of the car opens up. Yeah, the hood. It's such a great. I love that scene. I just think that's really yeah. clever and fun. Um, and of course, that's when the chaos starts, where she gets confused. Is it Randy? Is it Billy? Is it that's right? What's, what's going on here? And obviously. Yeah. It's revealed that we all know it's Billy. Yeah, um, and um, Matthew Lillard is brilliant as Stu as well. Yeah, uh, Stu is very he's very he's very funny. Again, it goes back to these guys are arguing in the kitchen <laughs> about yeah. okay, don't stab me that way, don't stab me too deep. Oh yeah. man, don't you cut me too deep? <laughs> and so, yeah, and Sydney goes. Um, oh, by the way, I've called the cops. And um, St- um, Stewie's basically, you know, got these really bad knife wounds. He's going, oh, oh my parents are going to be so mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> and but, but during that argument, when she's uh, pretty much in the kitchen, she's she knows she's kind of fucked. Yeah. But as she watches these two being lunatics at each other, yeah. She, again, she gives a look to where, oh wait a minute, I can get out of this. These guys are idiots. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. And Stu no, has an amazing day, a very sort of poetic death as well. You know, with the TV. <laughs> yeah, Death by Television. Yeah. Um, funny, but I still think a little over the top considering how smart the film was when he's yeah. at the end. We, yeah. Um, but the whole climax, everything about obviously the, the twist. The twist was pretty decent. I liked it. I liked the fact that Billy. Two colors. Yeah. And I like the fact that Billy. Yeah. Because how do you be two places at once? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I do like the, the fact that he's getting revenge because her mother was a tramp. Technically she was. Yeah. And it caused Billy's parents to break up. So he had it, he had it out for her, um, which I thought was kind of clever. And the whole time he just had to get rid of her virginity because he can't kill a virgin in a slasher film. That's right. Um, yeah. Braggy and playing with the rules. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and there's a really funny line, uh, um, uh, um, at the very end where it turns out that Randy hasn't been killed, and, and he says, you know, he goes something like, you know, I never thought I'd be so happy to be a virgin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, and that's it. That's the end of a scream. I think we got it. Yeah, for the most pretty part. much. Yeah, yeah, listen, listen, gang, I'm I'm a big fan of Scream, and I'll tell you why. Um, well, we're not gonna, I'm not going to break in a whole song of dance about it, because we kind of already talked about how much we liked it. But most importantly... It revived the slasher franchise, and what I mean by revived, not necessarily newer fran- newer slashers. I'm talking it revived the old ones. I think yeah. people by seeing this appreciate what a slasher film is and what it does. So by doing when done well, when done yeah. well, not even not even that, not even that. It's a lot of people roll their eyes at Friday Thirteenth um, and, and and other ones, uh, Prom Night and Terror Train, all these films. Because they have these silly cliches. You don't kill the virgin. You run up the wrong, you know. And this film played on that a bit. But it also showed you that, how do I put it? It showed you, it's A, it shows an interest in people wanting to go see the movies that this was kind of talking about. So it reopens that whole rewatchability where people go, okay, I want to see these films that yeah. Scream is basing itself on. Mm-hmm. Um, so it opened that window. But most importantly, it gave slasher films more of a charm. Uh, more credibility as more well. More credibility. Rather than people watching a slasher film from the 80s and just rolling their eyes. Yeah. Thanks to Scream, I think it just... It, 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 yeah. It, it, gave, it, it gave the slasher film a little more street cred. Yeah. Uh, and a new getting. sort of... And a, a new life sort and of a thing. new audience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, guys, uh, words can express. See Scream. I love the, fr- I love the movie. And, yeah. Uh, it's just, I mean, it, it uh, it's brilliantly directed, brilliantly written with with brilliant characters, um, perfectly cast characters as well. It's just, uh, um, regards horror films, it's just a lot of fun, and it's very clever at the same time. Exactly, and I always love when Dewey showed up. They had the old, the, old, the old spaghetti western theme going in the background. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> like he's the big sheriff in town. Yeah. Oh my god, Deputy Dewey Dewey. And Ta- Dewey and Tatum had some good lines. Yeah. Mom says you can't you can't talk to me like that when I'm wearing this badge. I'm a man <laughs> of the right. law. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah. Some fun lines in this one. Uh, yeah. that, that's a wrap on this one. That it's it's. Uh, I'm looking forward to revisiting part two. Uh, Trevor, thanks for joining me in this one. Great to be here as always. Yep. There you go. And thank you all for listening. You can follow us at Citizen Frame underscore podcast and, of course, on Facebook. Uh, give us a download. Always give us a shout out. Let you know our likes, dislikes, and uh, anything you want us to maybe review, maybe we'll get it on the air. Um, with that being said, that's a wrap, Bruno, and we'll see you soon. Or hear us soon. Or whatever the, whatever the term <laughs> would be. I don't know. Um, guys, have a good night.